Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Compass Quotidiano TV to our today's interview with Professor Fabrice Rotterdam from the Medical School of Wisconsin. Fabrice, welcome back to Compass. How are you? Thank you, Radu. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be uh, on your show. I'm doing very well. I hope you're doing well too. Thank you very much for asking. Always well when talking to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like once more to introduce Professor Jotterin. Professor Fabrice Jotterin uh, is a professor of bioethics and medical humanities and serves as a director of the graduate program in bioethics at the Medical College of Wisconsin, America. And you are also the director of philosophies of medical education and transformation laboratory. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk about transhumanism about bio-augmentation, where are the difference between medical pro uh, progress and transhumanism, if there is a boundary or not, and at which extent transhumanism is a distraction. Fabrice, yes, how would you first of all define transhumanism in order to draw a boundary to bio-augmentation, we need first to say what is transhumanism and uh, we, you would see a difference to bio-augmentation. So I think this is an important question to define transhumanism. In, and I would say transhumanism is an intellectual movement um, in the humanities, but also in science and in society uh, that attempts to use technoscience to transcend the limitations of our bodies and brains. So the idea is to use these technologies to augment our capacities in terms of physical abilities, cognitive abilities, et cetera, these type of human abilities to reason, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, what uh, the movement is trying to achieve is physical immortality. The idea would be to upload human consciousness on a hard drive and then create a bionic body. And then you would achieve a type of physical immortality. So the difference between transhumanism and then I would say uh, augmentation through uh, biotechnology in terms of genetics and other techniques, techniques, uh, it's it's more about you know what are you trying to achieve uh, long term. Uh, transhumanism has this kind of uh, esoteric, almost quasi-religious agenda as opposed to uh, traditional uh, bioenhancement. It's more about to improve the quality of life of a particular individual. So we have to distinguish between therapeutic uh, augmentations and some that are not therapeutic, uh, and but still the, the end goal will not be physical immortality as in uh, the transhumanist movement. But it's funny that at a certain extent, uh, transhumanists argue that it's for the benefit for your health. They don't say it straight that we are uh, uh, targeting the immortality, or even if they do so, but they argue with a, with a huge plus for one's health, which is creating uh, quite a confusion and a misunderstanding. Do you think that this is done on purpose? Well, of course, uh, they're going to add that element because it's more appealing. Because if you say, well, we're going to use these technologies just to enhance as opposed to uh, to have a therapeutic intervention, uh, it's less appealing. And then I think there are issues about, you know, the medical establishment. The transhumanist movement needs medicine to achieve these goals, right? And, and so they're going to add that uh, that element of therapy. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, it, it's not really the intention. The intention is the alteration. So I would say that there are therapeutic intervention that will have a enhancement component. Then there is pure uh, enhancement. Like, what about if I could, um, you know, read a book in, in 10 minutes as opposed to you know, four hours, right? Because I have a chip in the brain. This would be purely enhancement. But then the transhumanist movement is really about altering 
human nature, what we uh, consider as human nature traditionally, uh, you know, in terms of our cognitive ability, physical uh, abilities and lifespan, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is why they, they, they use that therapeutic dimension. Uh, now, you can think about, you know, combating aging and et cetera. It's in, intrinsically, there's nothing wrong to, 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 to have a better health, but ultimately what's behind it, it's, it's not therapy. It's more about enhancement and uh, alteration. You mentioned um, at the beginning of our discussion, the word movement. Now movement um, would indicate that something is almost like a sectarian movement or a religion. If we were to look at this aspect, what would you say would be the constitutive elements of a religion or of a religious-like movement? Do we find all the aspects which define a religion in the transhumanist movement? I would say yes, uh, because ultimately it's about, um, an, it's about an existential questions. What the transhumanist movement is trying to do is to address uh, an existential question. That is, how do we achieve physical immortality? How do we, uh, it, it's not about improving the human condition only, but it's also about asking this fundamental question about uh, immortality and death. What they try to do is to conquer death. And death is not a scientific question only, or a biological, uh, physiological question, but it's also an existential question. So then you have to ask the question about how do we achieve, how do we conquer death? What is death? And um, how do we, uh, well, put in place an agenda that will allow us to, to achieve that agenda? And then what is the God that they're worshiping? Well, it's technoscience. Technoscience becomes the means to achieve that particular goal, that is to achieve uh, physical immortality. And then you have to look at the roots of um, uh, the trans transhumanist movement uh, in terms of metaphysics. And, and, and so it provides a worldview, it provides a sense of purpose and meaning that is embedded in technoscience. Technoscience becomes how we perceive the world in, uh, in, 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 in this reality. And now I would say that even if you look at medicine, medicine has the same type of worldview, but medicine is not a, doesn't have the same kind of end goal because medicine is really about, you know, health, uh, healing, addressing question of illness, the transhumanist movement pushes the agenda way farther than just these scientific and, and, and medical questions. Uh, several scientists dealing with uh, transhumanism um, quote Nietzsche. Why do you think is Nietzsche so relevant for this movement? Because uh, regarding the aspect of metaphysics, I think it's extremely relevant to look more into detail uh, regarding Nietzsche. So I would say, yes, uh, Nietzsche is key to understand the transhumanist movement. So Nietzsche tried to provide, he wanted to critique Western culture. And what happened is um, he argues that we need to restore the good or what he, he thought was the good or the will to power in men. And to achieve that goal, he thought, we need to have a different type of human being, what he calls the Ubermensch. And the Ubermensch will be able to reevaluate all values in Western culture. And so this is why, if you think about what is the, this Ubermensch, it's, it's an individual that will transcend uh, the natural abilities, intellectual abilities in this case of the, 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 the of mankind. And so if you look at um, the roots of that ideology, how is this translated into, I would say, uh, the trans, trans, uh, transhumanist movement? Um, I think 
<clears throat> it questions um, you know, this reevaluation of all values of Western culture also question the legitimacy of mankind. And so um, how do we achieve, how do they achieve uh, this, uh, this agenda? Well, it, it is through technological av advancement. And then techno science becomes a worldview where you can really um, question the kind of Judeo-Christian tradition of how we understood uh, mankind, and then you're replacing it with this new metaphysical framework. I'm just gonna read a, um, a brief passage, if you don't mind, by- No, please, please uh, do so. By Rémi Bragg. Uh, he has a uh, book called Curing Mad Truth. And then he's uh, kind of asking questions about, uh, this is a, uh, the last paragraph of his book, but it's a question about Western culture and, and he's, he's analyzing why our Western culture is collapsing. And then he's asking the question, uh, how is this impacting human beings? But he said, now, what has to be salvaged is not a particular political system any longer, not even a definite civilization. It is mankind as a whole, the speaking animal, the converging animal that doubts of its own legitimacy and that needs grounds for wishing to push further the human adventure. So what he's saying is we come to a point where we understood in Western culture, we understood ourselves as human being in certain way, framed by this kind of Judeo-Christian tradition. And you don't need necessarily to be a religious person to, to see that. And to agree, yeah. And, and to agree. And now we see the collapse of Western values. And within that collapse, you see that our understanding of what it means to be human is also collapsing, replaced by what I said, this kind of techno-scientific worldview, this metaphysical, this new metaphysical uh, framework. But you mentioned um, Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche is taught at school. What's the, what's the role of education? I mean, could we say that it is no wonder that the transhumanist movement has uh, so many members and that average people are rather inclined to agree with the transhumanist agenda since maybe they were educated and taught in order to have a certain acceptance in favor of such ideas? Do you think that the education, that in education, uh, countries did something wrong? Well, uh, I would say yes. Uh, now, I had many discussions with uh, people here in the United States and even people who are ultra, I would say, ultra conservative. conservative. Yeah. Uh, but they even question, say, you know, they even question, why should we read Nietzsche or Marx or Freud? And I would say my answer is to say, read these authors, but always with a critical mind because you will understand what's happening in culture because you're gonna see the roots of where we are now. But in addition to that, you need to, end, to, to read people like Alistair McIntyre, Charles Taylor, Rémi Bragg uh, from a European perspective and understand their critique of modernity. Because if you just embrace Nietzsche, Marx and Freud and Darwin, and you don't read critical work, then you, you become very passive and you accept ideologies in ways that are problematic for a culture. I think we are doing a poor job these days in academia um, to, 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 to teach critical thinking and to provide alternative narratives um, to Nietzsche, to Marx, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we need to, to rethink the way we educate uh, the younger generation. Um, even yes, last night I had a conversation with my daughter. Uh, she's 20, she's in college. And she said, and it was very interesting, she said to me, but your generation failed us. And now in a post-COVID world with uh, a, a war in Ukraine, 
uh, well, the pandemic, the economy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these questions in, in that generation, they're like, well, where do I find meaning and purpose in, in this life? And I think we need to do a better job in college, but also it starts in the family, in institutions like churches, synagogues, et cetera, and, and, and really provide a sense of purpose and meaning in, in this world that is that can be very dark for, for the younger generation. But it's not just Nietzsche, Nietzsche. We mentioned Nietzsche, but then one step further, we have Wagner with his opera. So, I mean, um, we have a lot of um, Nordic mythology, which is promoted with cartoons, with music, with films, at which extent is, for instance, promoting such a Nordic mythology a danger to uh, 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 Christian society on its way in order to abandon or yeah, to give up uh, maybe old-fashioned values or uh, not to insult anyone um, in order to uh, preserve conservative values of a society. Yeah, but I think the, the the mistake that people make is to think that to hold on on, uh, I would say, traditional values is mm -hmm. it's not progressive. So society will not progress. And I think it's a big mistake. I think what we need to do, what we need to, where we need to, to be is we need to be conservative, but we need to conserve in culture what allows a culture to survive, to move forward, and for human beings to, to, um, to flourish. As opposed in, in our society, especially if you look at the, the, the wokeism that is part of our culture, is this idea to just erase everything from the past, and we're going to just look at the future and build a better society. But this is not how a culture works. A actually destroying needs, everything is the ultimate destruction. It's actually, at least my personal opinion, that we're dealing with a phenomenon of complete destruction of whatever offered uh, support, creed, belief, or whatever in traditional values. Well, yeah. And, 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 and so this idea of you know destroying uh deleting uh rejecting uh and then you see that it becomes a mindset among the, the younger generation and what you need to do is to go back to 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 determine and it's not about being nostalgic about saying oh in the 50s this is how we did it in the 60s this is what how we did it i think it's to to find the pillars that allow society western culture to survive to thrive uh, if you look in terms of the economy, in terms of science, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and then see what are these pillars that we need to support and sustain. The other issue is that institutions don't play a role anymore uh, in, in, in society. Uh, there is a crisis. And, and so the institutions in some ways are pillars in society, in culture, to support individuals, to create communities. And so we go from the government to 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 the the people, and there is no filter anymore. And and I think what we need to do is to rethink about how institutions can play a role again uh, in uh, shaping society, in supporting society, and supporting individuals and communities. What do you think, Marx, for instance? Was Marx a sort of transhumanist or did he have any contribution at all in promoting transhumanism? I have to say I... Oops. Oh, what happened? Actually, the technical scientific thought. Um, uh, wait, I you disappeared from my screen. I don't know where you are. No, here am I. Oh. I something uh, I got cut off. <laughs> Boris, I asked so you, can, you. Can you do what some do you think, Yes, I asked you if, in your opinion, Marx had a certain contribution to the transhumanist movement, or if Marx might have been a transhumanist, particularly against the background 
of the technical utopian ambitions during the early stages of Soviet Russia and the influence which the Russian philosophy had on Hegel and uh, Marx, particularly with the utopians of resurrecting uh, uh, the death to life, which is a concept in the so-called Russian cosmist movement. We don't need to go into details uh, with cosmism, but at which extent might have Marx influenced transhumanism? So I haven't looked specifically uh, at the works, uh, the work of Marx, but what I would say is that one aspect of technology it is this idea of you know um putting everybody at the same level you know the the technology provides a way to provide a, a kind of egalitarian society and if you think about uh what marx was trying to do um he had that same mindset in society so from an ideal, ideological uh, standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, I'm pretty sure there is this kind of mindset, there is that mindset in the transhumanist movement is to create a society, a more egalitarian society and remove all inequalities. And so, um, I mean, do people, um, I think a lot of, I, it would be interesting to to do a, an analysis whether there was a strong connection with Marxism and transhumanism. But based on my analysis, and I have to say I haven't really taken a deep dive uh, into Marx and, and, and transhumanism, but I, I, I could see some connection there from a uh, yeah, uh, philosophical standpoint. For instance, I'd like to quote from a speech of Trotsky. Um, he said, 1924, Darwin can be placed on the same, in the same category. This highly gifted biologist demonstrated how an accumulation of small quantitative variations produces an entirely new biologic quality. And by that token, he explained the origin of species. Without being aware of it, he thus applied the method of dialectic materialism to the sphere of organic life. Darwin, although unenlightened in philosophy, brilliantly applied Hegel's law of transition from quantity into quality. At the same time, we very often discover in this same Darwin, not to mention the Darwinians, utterly naive and unscientific attempts at applying the conclusions of biology to society. To interpret competition as a variety of biological struggle for existence is like seeing only mechani mechanics in the physiology of mating. I will not, um, that just uh, in order to uh, uh, stimulate one's appetite to read transhumanist aspects in, uh, in Trotsky, he said that after having succeeded in the struggle, uh, uh, in the materialistic struggle, society needs to go on in, uh, in its endeavor and continue the struggle in the laboratories of chemistry. So I think that's somehow strange that at the beginning of the Soviet Union, this very occult and sectarian movement of cosmism uh, influenced this tragedy of, so of the early Soviet Union and how whatever civilization had built so far was destroyed by this Bolshevik movement. And it's interesting, Professor Rosenthal, um, uh, Fabrice Glatzer Rosenthal, an American uh, Slavist and expert in the cosmist movement, had published 19, I think, 92 or 1993, a very interesting paper related to this Russian transhumanist movement. And he regards it as, the, as one of the most severe threats to modern society, because this concept is perpetuated by arts, culture, mm -hmm. education, and it's almost impossible to sweep away um, with it. Yeah, but I, I think here, when you say this materialist struggle, right? Uh, I think this is, we need to do, to do some work in metaphysics 
and, 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 and really understand what kind of worldview they have. From their perspective, all there is, is just, you know, material, so to speak. Um, uh, the reality, there is no transcendence. Everything is imminent. And, and so from that perspective, uh, when you have this kind of existential question about death, about the future of humanity, the future of a particular individual, uh, then you're going to have that struggle. And all there is, is to combat death from a materialistic standpoint, using science, using biology. Um, and so in that sense, this is why- Science I, is egalitarian. Science as in technology, techno-science. Because I think we need to put techno uh, science and technology together. Science needs technology for its application. Technology needs science for its um, development. And so the two of them work together. Um, and, and, and so this is why I think uh, theology can bring some insights that philosophy proper and then, of course, science doesn't have. Uh, because I think over, let's say, Christian theology, over 2,000 years, people have been thinking about these questions. Uh, and, and, and so we need to, um, to rethink how we address these questions and what is the nature of the interplay between the hard sciences and then the humanities and the social sciences. And we cannot simply reduce uh, everything to techno-science but open the door to the humanities and the social science to be part of this discourse about, because I think this, this question about transhumanism is really about, goes at the core of what does it mean to be human and what is the future of humanity? And, and so we cannot just address this question through uh, science and technology. Is it a sort of distraction when transhumanists always present, as we discussed before, the advantages? I mean, at each of these challenges which you mentioned, transhumanists will have a good reason to tell you that the perfect way it should work. I mean, if we um, should you now go back to, um, uh, um, in case we'd go back to Julian Huxley, who coined the term of uh, transhumanism, the brother of the very famous uh, writer Aldous Huxley, he believed that true socialism uh, could only be achieved by terms of biology. So if an egalitarian society is to be achieved, the transhumanists will say we need science in order to have, let's say, uh, uh, to discover and to implement certain biological, or physiological or chemical processes in order to create a human being, which will be, let's say, more self-sufficient and, uh, and able to create an egalitarian society. Yeah, but... Historically, what have we seen, observed? Because then you go into social Darwinism. Then you go into uh, <clears throat> eugenics because you want a, a, a pure egalitarian society where everybody's the same. And then we, we have, a, of course, we, have, we want people to be healthy, but then people with disabilities will be affected by that kind of uh, ideology. So an egalitarian society uh, in terms of access, I would say yes, but we need diversity in terms of individual. We need people with uh, disabilities to exist within that uh, framework and to apply this kind of um, you know, social Darwinism to achieve a particular political agenda, we know where it leads. Uh, Nazi Germany and some countries in uh, Eastern uh, Europe, uh, we know the disaster. And, and so again, um, the intention is good, uh, the means are problematic, and the end result, we know what it is. So I think we, um, we have to be very careful how we, we use uh, biology uh, to to achieve or biology, science, and technology to achieve a egalitarian society. Should actually the immortality be the final target of the transhumanist movement? What would be the consequences? Um, 
if the just to understand your question right what are the consequences yeah, if what type of society would we have if all would be immortal well would i mean immortality be something with migrated uh, migrated consciousness on a sort of electronic platform how would this immortality work what would be so, the consequences for an immortal society so that that would be it's an interesting question because we, you can take the question two ways one is will the future of humanity be purely virtual right so you create an identity and then you live your world uh virtually and then you become just um um passive in terms of your embody uh, in terms of your uh, corporeality but everything is kind of virtual on the other hand you could say well what about if we stop having children everybody becomes immortal and that's it then the world will not have new uh individuals being part of society and, and, and so you can imagine you know what it means to be a human being is also to to have children uh to to create relationship with children and and then grandchildren and then have a, a kind of sense of purpose and meaning in life other than just be there and then be part of various activities and and uh and, and not create communities and participate in the life of others uh in in a meaningful way other than just doing activities together because we are immortal and we can do whatever we want. So I think it will question uh, it would question um what it means to 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 become a human being or not to become but rather to develop as a human being uh because basically uh a virtual world you could create your own persona and then you know everybody could become the same because we have a particular sense of what is a good human being or at least uh, to a certain extent and we could say no we don't want to be like this but everybody should be like this uh and so then it raises question about personal identity and how we achieve these goals the last question which i'd like to ask you is what's the concept of transhumanists regarding the free will how are they related to each other is there space or room for free will in a transhumanist in the transhumanist concept uh yes uh there must be some sense of a an aspect of free will that being said if our personalities and behaviors are determined by technology I think the danger is to have a kind of deterministic and reductionistic approach to human behavior. Um let's say you uh you have a the ideal type of human being. Uh let's look at the more bioenhancement idea that is to use technology to control, manipulate and uh improve human behavior. How are you going to achieve that? Let's uh let's say you have a chip that you implant in the brain uh to control behavior. But it's always in some ways the chip, the content of that chip or how the chip will manipulate behavior in an individual will always assume that there is a human being that or a group of human being dictating how the behavior right behavior what right behavior is. So in that sense, it could undermine free will. It could undermine agency. And in, in that sense, uh, it can be dangerous and maybe free will could be undermined. But um, if you take free will in, in a sense as determination, self-determination and say, I do whatever I want with my body, well, yes. But then it, it becomes an absurd notion of autonomy and self-determination because then it becomes, it's something that you impose on others and say, hey, I want you to provide a particular service so I can have three legs or I can have uh, enhance my brain, et cetera, et cetera. This sort of self-determination within the concept of the free will is one within, let's say, 
uh, some boundaries well traced by the cons by moral values and by uh, a path according to let's say biblical values if i'm not wrong now if this concept a free will and self self determination within this let's say religious uh, uh, boundaries is changed by a programmer then one might say that the creator is then replaced with the programmer of the artificial intelligence which which will then trace how a society should develop what self determination then would mean within new boundaries imposed by artificial intelligence Yes, and, and this is the danger of allowing uh, technology to or a group of people to to have access to certain technologies without the public knowing what is uh, what is at stake. Believe it or not, I have a colleague, and I will not name that individual, but he believes if we have a technology available that would uh, allow society to be in a better place the government should use that technology covertly. And so the danger is then you become, uh, you, 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 you see a society uh, developing in ways where the government is taking over. Individuals don't know what's happening. Uh, let's say you could put a, a pill in, in water or a product, a, a drug in the water, nobody knows. Of course, this is hypothetical, uh, but you know these ideas are floating, and people are pushing these ideas the same way. And the argument is to say it's a public health issue. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you're willing to jeopardize uh, self determination, the autonomy of citizens, their voices, in order to create a better society? I'm not sure this will uh, be the way to go. Um, and, and, and so, um, now could we use this technology to enhance behavior? Yes. We want a better society. Nobody would say no, uh, to, to, uh, to ways to, to improve the, uh, human interactions and, and combat criminality, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, we, we need to set boundaries. What is funny, what seems funny to me is that one of the most inflationary world, uh, wor words in our society is value, which is a true value in the transhumanist movement. That's something I did not come across. <laughs> you mean a, a particular value? Yeah. What uh, is, is the there particular a value? set of values? Is there a catalog of values? I have not encountered any value. It's like a, it's like a maniac run in order to attain uh, some goals. Uh, as you said, immortality. But at which that, extent, which is the that, price to pay for something. The concept of value is something which I did not encounter in whatever I read about transhumanism. Maybe I read uh, the wrong articles, but that's something which I'm really missing. Because they're unable to ground their thinking, their ideology in something, a metaphysical <laughs> framework that provides the granting of these principles. I don't like to use value because principles. You say they, yes, they have values. They value certain things, but it's more about some, I would say, metaphysical assumptions, some beliefs uh, that are needed and they cannot ground these uh, beliefs on something more than just the individual. That is, you know, question of preference self yeah, they have uh, preferences what what i mean by values maybe i used the wrong term was yes. uh, uh, metaphysical principles yes well I, I, and 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 so this is why uh it, it's very difficult to um but that being said as i said in the beginning it's techno science what technology and science afford afford is their value whatever it's very pragmatic it's very utilitarian and it's based on self determination and and it's it's in it's a perver perversion of autonomy and self determination because it becomes this ideology that all that matters is the individual and there is nothing outside the individual that provide like institutions or if you're religious say god or 
um, something outside the individual that provide a framework and say, well, maybe I shouldn't do it. Uh, maybe this is wrong. But it's all about self-determination and um, what people, what the individual value. Um, yeah, so. I think particularly uh, since you're teaching biomedical ethics at such a famous uh, university, I think you have a very, very responsible profession because you are forming, shaping future generations of physicians. And I, I may only wish that you may be successful in emancipating this future generation of physicians in absorbing your concept of, um, of metaphysics, of values in society, of Christian values, in order to have good physicians who will always double look if and how to keep, make the difference between bio-augmentation and transhumanism. Well, what's very interesting, um, believe it or not, and I didn't think I would be able to do so, but I had a, uh, a colleague at the University of Chicago at the Pritzker School of Medicine, he's a physician, and uh, I was at a conference and he, I gave a talk and he approached me and said, hey, can we talk because I'm interested in, in your work. And then we ended up, I ended up inviting him at my institution and we mm -hmm. gave a talk on metaphysics and medicine and that the idea so and um so i think uh, i've been given a platform where i can talk about these questions and you don't need necessarily to go into the religious uh in, into religious thought but it's really to question the metaphysics of medicine and part of my work, uh, as you mentioned, I'm part of the Kern Institute. So I spend half my time in bioethics and half my time at the Kern Institute at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And I run my own lab, the Philosophies of Medical Education Transformation Lab. And we do this type of work for the reason you mentioned, because I think if we want to transform medical education in light of what we see in medicine these days, there is a crisis in uh, in medicine. Medicine is not attractive. We see anymore and we need more physicians. And then we see a high level of suicide among physicians, uh, burnout, more injury, uh, physicians leaving the profession. And we need to rethink about medicine, at least in the United States. My understanding that uh, it's not better in Europe, it's not better in Switzerland. Um, so uh, I think this is important work. And it's not just intellectual work it has implications for um real world uh problems in yeah. medicine but outside medicine too should the concept of life be a changing one under the impact or influence of transhumanism obviously the concept of life something physicians are dealing with would change as well at least would alter as well. So maybe we could make it the other way around. You might influence them to prevent altering this concept of life in order to deal better or more proper or, prop or properly with transhumanism. I wasn't sure about the, the concept of what? I said um, uh, uh, um, that in medicine, the concept of life. Oh, the concept of life. Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, this is really uh, at the at the core of what uh, needs to be done in, in terms of, you know, um, in, in the healthcare system is basically geared toward fighting death as opposed to a system that promotes life. And so we are always uh, being uh, reactive to in what's a defensive happening. position. Yes. And, and, and so uh, I think we need to change the, the, the mindset and, and, and think about life and what does it mean from, from the beginning to the end? What does it mean to, to live? What is life? Uh, but as you can imagine, this is a question that is very difficult, that is very uh, controversial. Um, but instead of you know, trying to, to conquer scientifically death, what about if we, we spend our energy to say, what about if we promote life? 
What about if we we want individuals to to flourish as opposed to just look at something that, um, in my view, at least based on what I know so far, uh, we're not going to be able to to achieve in terms of conquering death. Uh, you know, uh, the, the way the transhumanists are, are trying to do it. But believe it or not, it's this kind of ideology is still pre prevalent in is uh, prevalent in, in, in medicine in, in, in general. Fabrice, we will continue this type of uh, discussions also in the future because it's so interesting and challenging to look into so many aspects, historical, religious, political, health aspects related to transhumanism, because I think it's um, uh, relevant to emancipate people and to stir their interest to look closer to transhumanism, because that's it's not just a term we, we read about uh, in the newspaper, It's something not just affecting our lives, it's affecting life and us as species, as human beings. And I think you have a very, very important contribution in this debate. And thank you very much for having joined me here on Compass Quotidiano TV. And lots of success in future and looking forward to seeing you soon, Fabrice. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'm glad to come back on the show. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.